Yeah. Hello, Crystal. Um, uh, Luke Dwee, uh, Crystal Tech TV, uh, doing with your development at Mon, doing our one project for me vertical. Uh, welcome to our first webinar in the Tech TV series. Uh, we are, uh, as some of you may not know who Mentor Mon are and what we do, we're a uh, an enterprise agency. We're based on Anglesey uh, and we support uh, a number of projects, uh, one of which is vertical farming. We're also active in marine energy and uh, the forestry sector. We are interested in the possibilities that vertical farming offer and uh, Tech TV at the moment is a pilot scheme uh, which involves us uh, allocating vertical farms to uh, people who are wanting to make a start in, in growing uh, using hydroponics. And as part of this, we are running a series of uh, educational experiences, webinars and uh, workshops uh, that at the moment are all going to be online. And it's the first one that we are hosting that's open to the uh, open to the public. So um, we have um, we're going to hear a bit more about our speakers from their own uh, their own perspectives in a moment. But um, uh, for anybody who's uh, just joined, uh, we're going to uh, as as they speak, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat box. I'll keep an eye on the chat box, and when they come to the end of their uh, the speakers come to the end of what they have to say, I shall put your questions to them. If anything uh, if anything uh, uh, occurs to you that might stimulate some useful uh, some useful conversation. So, without any uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome John Ross, who is the director of So the City in Manchester, um, and uh, I'll be, I think we shall all be very interested to hear uh, his perspective on vertical farming and I'll hand the floor over to you, John. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, and um, thanks for inviting me, Luke, to uh, run this webinar. Um, I'm John. I'm a director at So The City, uh, which is a social enterprise in Manchester. Um, we've got about 40 minutes to talk about vertical farming and um, particularly hydroponics. And then there's gonna be 20 minutes at the end to uh, go through some questions. So feel free to put some um, of those into the chat box um, and we'll do our best to answer those at the end. Um, our experience at So The City is, is community, what I probably call community hydroponics really, rather than industrial, very high tech systems. Um, we've been developing our own DIY systems on a small scale now for a few years. Um, and we've had fun having a go at it and learning about it. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about some of those some, some of those systems that we've developed. I think, in theory, at least, hydroponics, vertical farming, aquaponics, etc., has got the potential to tackle some of the really big issues that there are around sustainable food, um, climate change, you know, soil depletion, uh, problems like peak phosphorus, food miles. Um, food poverty, etc. Um, but it's it's still um, a, an emerging technology. It's been around a while, actually, but it's still being developed. And um, there's a huge amount of innovation in it uh, at the moment. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I think the jury's still out a little bit about whether it's it's um, not the solution, but part of the solution. Um, but uh, yeah, we're certainly interested in it. And um, I, I, I guess that's what um, Luke's project is about as well. Just trying to test it out and, and see, see you know, what use it, it can have. So I'm joined today by Jules uh, Bagnoli. And hopefully I've pronounced that right. Um, I'm <laughs> yeah. going to let her uh, introduce herself, um, but she's going to be um, going through some slides towards the end of the presentation. Yeah, uh, I'm, my background's in industrial marketing B2B, but then I took a bit of a left turn and became a restaurateur and chef. And as part of that, started to work with, um, with food producers and farmers and grow my own food to supply the restaurants. So it was a sort of an unusual way to get into small scale farming. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jules. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, us at So The City and what we do, um, but then we'll get straight into some of the projects we've been working on. Uh, this this European City of Science project, uh, which was 
our first and largest hydroponics project. So we'll cover that in some detail. We've been working on a Salford University project, um, some academic research, uh, looking at the economic feasibility of hydroponics specifically. We've been doing some smaller, you know, micro systems with, with the community. And I, I, as I said at the start, really our specialist area is, is um, you know, is, is kind of community hydroponics, if that's a thing. I don't know if I've just invented that actually, but um, yeah, it's, it's certainly, so, so, you know, rather than the larger systems, uh, I'm going to talk about the Boiler House, which is our new centre. Uh, Jules has got a few slides about some of the work she's been doing, and we will um, wrap it up at the end. So, so the city was set up in 2009 with a few packets of seeds and a few bags of compost, and we're over 10 years old now. We saw the potential of urban agriculture to transform Manchester into a healthier and greener city. We realised that gardens, allotments, patios, you know, rooftops even, and and smaller areas like window ledges, um, you know, walls, all have the potential to provide us with an abundance of free and nutritious food. Plus, of course, food grown in urban environments can help to reduce food transportation, um, you know, carbon emissions, create jobs and also strengthen communities. Since we set up, we've taught thousands of people to grow their own, particularly in the most disadvantaged communities in Manchester, providing horticultural therapy, nature-based activities, um, forest school sessions for inner city schools, um, sessions for people with mental ill health, you know, drug and alcohol addiction, uh, homeless people. Um, and so, yeah, there's a wide variety of people that have have um, benefited from from the work that we've been doing in Manchester. We're funded by the NHS, uh, about fifty percent by the NHS these days, um, and also the councils to a lesser degree, and quite a lot of grant funding and and government funding. Uh, we also design and build gardens, particularly edible and wildlife gardens, and we undertake consultancy. So we're doing some food poverty mapping at the moment in Manchester, looking at uh, where there is um, you know, access to fresh fruit and vegetables and where there's access to, um, well, where there are food swamps in Manchester, where there's huge concentrations of, of takeaways and looking at how those might um uh, might um, interact with, you know, schools in the city as well, um, and obesity. And we're involved in sustainable food policy as well, to some extent. So yeah, we're all we're pretty busy. Uh, there's only four of us. Um, but it's an interesting job. And, um, and fortunately, uh, quite a creative one as well, sometimes. And um, this hydroponics stuff um, is definitely in that category. So hydroponics, um, um, it's not a new idea. Um, potentially it's, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a, a new way, um, of, it, of, of growing food. Um, it simply means growing plants without soil in its basic form. Hydroponics, uh, consists of a water reservoir and a pump that circulates nutrients round to the plant roots and back to the reservoir again. Plants are either grown directly in the nutrient solution or they're grown in an inert growing medium such as um, expanded clay balls. And you could argue that hydroponics was invented by uh, the Babylonians. So the Hanging Gardens of Babylon used hydroponics to some extent. Um, However, modern day hydroponics was born in the 19th and 20th century. The scientists started to get a better grip of um, plant biochemistry and plant nutrition. And it's been particular popular, particularly popular in the last 10 years or so. And there's been a surge in interest in hydroponics, um, you know, due to various projects, um, you know, for example, growing under, underground down in London and, and other, um, on the right hand side there, we've got this is um, a, a system that was set up by by NASA because they're interested in hydroponics for for going out into space and and having sustainable food to supplies in in space and also being able to um, 
you know, have that the therapeutic benefits of, of being in plants whilst in space. Uh, there's also IKEA who've who've got a system that they've they've been selling. And then there's these these, these sort of multi million pound um, large scale systems that have been developed around the world, particularly in, in parts of the world where there is less land available or it's, you know, particularly poor growing conditions. So that I think there's a few, particularly in Asia, I think there's a few in, in there's one in Hong Kong I'm thinking of and, and Singapore as well, where, where they're, you know, particularly large scale and um, this, this is sort of high population, but um, limited land supply for agriculture. So, uh, today I'm going to talk, it's quite, it's quite a big area, um, hydroponics. So, and there's quite a lot of different types of systems of which I have not worked with actually, um, put frankly, but, um, NFT systems is one that I know, um, about to some extent. And uh, I believe the Vidra farm system that some of you are going to be using is, is an NFT system as well. So it is relevant for you. Um, it's, it's a system where there's a very shallow stream of water containing all the dissolved nutrients required for plant growth that circulated past the roots of the plant. So if you look on that diagram there, um, the plant roots are dangling down into that nutrient um, solution um, in, a, in a watertight gully. Um, sometimes these are called channels and as the, the nutrients flow, plas, flow past the, the, the plant roots, the roots absorb those nutrients and, you know, the nutrient flows down, down the channel, back to the tank again, and then is pumped back round again. So th that nutrient is circulating round in the system. Um, there's a couple of features to it. It's got um, an air pump and the air pump provides oxygen for the nutrient solution. Plant roots do need some oxygen and the, the air pump uh, is attached to an air stone, which is that little blue thing there. And the air stone's just like what you'd find in a, in a um, fish tank and it bubbles air through the nutrient solution and just oxygenates the, the solution, um, you know, as it's flowing around. Um, it's, uh, got a angle to it and the the preferred angle is about 30 to 1 um, ratio and so it's important to try and get the the flow of nutrient at the right speed as it's going through the nft system so we don't want it to be just sort of gushing past the roots um, but you don't want it to be going too slowly either if it goes too fast the plant roots don't absorb enough nutrients if it goes too slowly then you get sort of pooling um, you're probably more likely to get roots that are, that are going to start to rot um, and also there would be less nutrients available for the plants because um, they'd be using them up and um, and that that nutrient fresh nutrient wouldn't be coming to the plant roots um, the nutrient in the water is provided through fertilizer and fertilizers are available that are chemical fertilizers and these contain all of the macro and micro essential nutrients for the plants to grow um, so nitrogen potassium phosphorus and then some of the trace elements like iron um, boron um, etc so we have um, used um, we've used chemical fertilizer and that's freely available and uh, it means that the plants have access to all of these nutrients that they need. They've been specifically engineered to provide exactly what the plants need. Um, you can also use an organic system. We've trialed organic systems um, a little bit. We've used comfrey feed. We've used um, um, seaweed extracts, um, nettle feed. Uh, we have had some success with organic hydroponics, um, but, but maybe plants haven't grown quite as well. Um, so I think that's an interesting area. I mean, I think that, as I was saying at the start, I think for hydroponics to be part of a sustainable food production, um, obviously we need to be thinking about um, fertilizer, which is, which is um, you know, requires a huge amount of energy to, to produce and, 
and um, for this to be um, a sustainable technology, then then it would need to be an organic system that we'd you know that we'd be developing. And I think if you are um, you know trying out these systems, I think it would be interesting for you to, to to have a go at organic hydroponics with them and maybe compare your results. You can measure the amount of fertilizer that is in the system by its electroconductivity, and you can buy a meter to do that. And it, it, it there, there is, um, it, if there's more nutrients in the, in the solution, then the electroconductivity will go up. And if there's less, the electroconductivity will go down. Um, and you can look up and see, you know, what the right amount is. And, 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 and you can feed your plants accordingly to make sure that you've got the right amount of, of nutrient in there. Um, what does happen though, is that the plants start to, to, to use up the nutrient as they're growing. Um, and actually this can fluctuate quite, um, quite quickly. Um, sometimes at different stages of the plant growth, they'll grow very quickly and they'll take up a lot of nutrients. And there's also interdependencies between the different nutrients as well. So different nutrients can, can go up, um, you know, together or independently. And that, you know, there can be a sort of flux in, in nutrient levels. So again, it's just something that you want to watch out for as you're using your system. Um, yeah, pH, you want to be trying to get it to about 6.5. We tend to use one of those, um, those pH testing kits with the green liquid in that you use for soil. You can get very expensive pH testing, um, you know, um, monitors, um, but actually that's really quick and, and really cost effective. So I'd recommend that if you want to check the pH, it only takes a few seconds, really. You just take out a little bit of the water out of the nutrient tank, and then you add some of that green liquid, pH testing liquid, and, you know, you get the results straight away. Um, the temperature of the water is important in the tank. So you want around 18 to 24 degrees C. I think above that, the water probably doesn't, um, doesn't, can't contain as much oxygen. So that becomes an issue for the plants. And then the amount of water. So we want around 40 plants for around 20 liters. So we want about half a liter of water per plant or nutrient solution per plant. Um, and that, 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 that's a minimum as well. Um, I, it, it, sorry, this is a sort of a quite a long slide trying to talk about hydroponics, but, um, uh, yeah, there are various other issues as well around, um, algae potentially, um, fungal diseases. Um, and, and one of the issues with, with hydroponics is that these can spread to all the plants, um, because they're all in one whole system. Um, it can, it, you know, it can, it can quickly spread around the plants and I don't think I've got time to sort of talk through all of those those issues now um but you know it's one of these things where you need to have a go with it <laughs> and then learn as you go along um and um yeah what I do is just just set your systems up and just bear in mind that you might have to tinker around with things like the flow rate um the the levels of nutrient, the pH levels, um, you know, the type of fertilizer you're using and, and, and you will see when you get it right, because the plants will, will grow actually, you know, very well, if not better than you would normally see, um, outdoors. Okay. So this is an example of one of the projects we've been working on uh it's a few years ago now and it was a hydroponic system uh, for for uh, a um well it's for a uh, it's for the european city of science and it was for a, a specific project as part of that called the allotment of the future and the allotment of the future was showcasing new futuristic food growing technology it included mushroom growing um uh, eating insects, actually, um, uh, growing algae um, to eat as well. And I suppose the idea was to strike up a conversation um, with the public about um, what 
uh, sustainable food is, um, you know, what would happen in the future if we had, you know, twice the population of the world um, and there was a lot less land available um, and just to generate a discussion really um, with people. And uh, it was in St. Anne Square in the middle of Manchester. So it was in a really public place and we got a lot of visitors and we developed this hydroponic system to to really to for 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 engagement mainly just to, to to get people interested and excited about the technology and and talking and the system to make it a little bit more futuristic i suppose um and uh and make it um you know environmentally more interesting we uh, attached a, a solar panel to, to the hydroponic system and that meant that it was a really a closed loop system so the solar panel provided electricity um, renewable electricity obviously to power the pump and the pump pumps the water around the hydroponic system and so um, in theory if you were you know, in the middle of the, the, the Sahara Desert, uh, you could get this system and, and um, with very little um, input, you could grow plants in, in that sort of environment. So this is the system actually in St. Anne's Square. And it's, uh, it had a, there was a tank in the in the wooden box you can see on the left there. Uh, the tank had about 15 watt pump in it, which is plenty actually to be able to pump. So it's quite low electricity demand really um, to pump the water up to the top tube. And then uh, the water flowed down through the tubes um, all the way down to the bottom tube and then back into the tank again. Uh, the system was, it was a hundred watt solar panel. The system was, pretty much self-sufficient with energy generated by the panel. Um, the panel put, charged a battery actually in um, a leisure battery in the, in the, you know, in that wooden box. And that meant that, um, you know, when during the night, the, the pump could still operate. And we built the system out of soil pipe. So these are PVC um, pipes that are hundred millimeters um, uh, diameter. Um, these white big pipes, and we, we did it all ourselves. So we drilled the holes for the plants to go into. I'll explain how that works in a minute. Um, we, we bought some hydroponic equipment from a hydroponic shop. We had some, um, we had some valves which go into the end of the pipes, which we had to buy some of the hose we bought, we bought the pump actually as well from, from the shop and on those taps, not sure if you can see them really. Uh, I can just about, but I've got a massive screen here. Um, there's some little red taps. So that meant that we could regulate the, um, as the water was coming up from the tank, we could regulate the flow. And there was lots of fiddling around and testing to make sure that those flow rates were right. But the system worked really well. And we grew there's something like 50 plants or so just in that two meter by one meter area. So it is quite effective in terms of, um, you know, maximizing yield in quite a small area we tried to make it as futuristic as possible because it was this allotment of the future so all of the white pipes that form the structure that supports the hydroponic system aren't doing anything actually um they're not they're not transporting liquids around or anything they're just trying to make it look as complicated as possible really and we did find some japanese tourists that visited um actually thought we were from NASA. Um, so I think we did a pretty good job of um, making it um, as futuristic as possible. And in terms of cost, um, I mean, I, I could, I still have the, the sort of breakdown of, of that sort of stuff. So if people want to, to, to do something like that, then, then, then please get in touch. And uh, I think it was about a thousand pounds or so. I haven't had time before this presentation to, to, to sort of look it up in detail. Um, the panel itself, the solar panel and all that equipment was probably around, you know, 250 pounds. And, um, so yeah, it was, it, 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 it's not cheap actually. Um, and it, it obviously took a couple of days to make it. 
Um, it's still going now. It's it's on the Printworks roof, if you know the Printworks in Manchester, uh, which is like a sort of cinema and entertainment complex. And they have a rooftop garden there. Um, and yeah, it's it, it's being looked after on there at the moment. So here are some of the plants that are growing. On this slide, I just wanted to say that some plants grew really well and other grant plants didn't grow so well. We found that lettuce, uh, we did some chard, I think, some tomatoes. On the Printworks roof, they've been growing um, some herbs, I think parsley and also um, I think they did some courgettes as well and those have all grown really quite well. Um, we did try and grow some chilies, they didn't really grow at all and then obviously you wouldn't be growing things like root crops in, in, a, in a hydroponic system. You can also see on this slide that the, this is the soil pipe that we're looking at here, these, these big 100 millimeter um, diameter tubes. We've drilled a hole into the tube and we've inserted this net pot. They're available from a from a hydroponic shop. And there's those clay balls as well. And again, they're available from a hydroponic shop. Um, they're expanded clay balls. And really they just provide a sort of um, a soil substitute um, just to keep the, um, the, 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 it provides a structure and a kind of growing medium for the plant to grow in. There's no soil there. Um, those balls are, are, are sort of around a centimetre wide and, and they're, they're just in the pot. In the tube itself, there's some, unfortunately I haven't got a photo, but there's about, um, about a centimetre, maybe two centimetres depth of um, nutrient which is flowing through that tube. And it looks a little bit like this. Uh, the roots start to grow down into the, the liquid which is flowing past and uh, what you want to be looking out for it's a really good way to see whether the system is working well or not is that you want those roots to be really nice and white and when things start to go wrong they tend to go a sort of brownie color and then they can start to rot after that and you will find that the plants if they're growing well in a hydroponic system uh, will develop absolutely massive root balls uh, and actually it even becomes a problem where you end up with the tubes getting blocked because the roots are so big. But of course, those big roots are a good a good thing on the whole um, because they mean that the plant can suck up more nutrients and more water and more oxygen and grow faster. Uh, so yeah, this is just sort of, I just found some of my little sketches from when we were looking at how to do this. I think I've covered all of this content though. And here's another project that we've been working on. And this was with Salford University. And they were looking into high-tech sustainable food growing options. Um, uh, and it was commissioned by Food Futures, which is basically public health um, in Manchester City Council and they looked at a variety of different technologies but we we um, helped specifically looking at hydroponics and the economic feasibility of developing hydroponic systems at a bigger scale in Manchester and we developed a model um, in Excel and it's basically just a yeah big spreadsheet and it, it allows you to enter, um, probably best to go on to the next slide actually, it allows you to enter the uh, different costs that you would have. So all of these, um, these, these values are editable. Um, so you can put in the cost per meter squared of LED lighting, of the piping and tubing that I was talking about. Um, you can um, enter you know, your electricity costs and it will calculate how much electricity um, is needed to use the system per year um, and also over the lifetime of the system. You can also enter the costs of water, labour, even things like insurance, marketing and rent. And 
uh, what we found is that that there is the potential to 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 get a kind of fairly decent return on investment from hydroponics um i mean it was a it was a sort of the model was developed over a long period of time we didn't really uh, i certainly wouldn't use the if we go back to this this i mean Anna, luke will share and we will share this model with everybody so you can kind of edit it yourself and play around with it the idea really is to test ideas rather than looking at the figures that i've got on the screen and, and sort of taking those as as, as written in stone um electricity for example here is is 10 10 p per kilowatt hour which is probably a little bit low um but um yeah you can use that 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 model and start to figure out whether it's worth investing you know larger amounts of money into hydroponics as a as an actual sort of viable business model um what we found was that if you had very low rent um for some some land so maybe maybe it's a rooftop maybe it was a basement um and you it would certainly be very low in terms of the labor costs as well to run the system um then potentially there is a sort of return on investment of around eight years okay and the last bit from me is just about growing manchester so this is another project that we 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 work on and it, it's one of the biggest ones that we've we've been working on over the years and it's a, it's a whole program actually of of work working with community food growing groups across manchester it started around um eight nine years ago and there was only 10 community food growing groups in manchester and we've now got 120 and it really is a testament to um, public authorities actually doing the same thing for a long period of time and, you know, really de developing momentum. We support the groups with providing funding, um, advice, um, set, you know, managing volunteers, doing contaminated land surveys um, to, to check that the land's okay for them to start to grow in. And the groups that we're, we're sort of, typically groups are getting in touch with a, with a sort of patch of land that they want to transform into a new community garden project and the groups range from local residents but also you know we have we have projects that are in hospitals and we have projects that are in um care homes for example and there's a whole diverse group and some in schools so there's a whole variety of people that are that are growing and we manage the program and we provide horticultural workshops, events, um, et cetera. And uh, we have done some hydroponics with those uh, with those groups and it's on a very small scale. So we've done some at the Yin Community Centre and they've got these these little this little micro system which they're testing out and um, they actually have an aquaponics system there as well so they are um the last i heard i think they were thinking about connecting that up to their aquaponics system and then also hall lane day resource center which is a it's a center for um adults with learning disabilities and these these systems are, are you know you could set up something like this for um certainly if you've got the you know the equipment to sort of drill some holes and um a little bit of sort of diy um ability then you could set it up for, for probably for under 50 pounds um it's just a bucket which is under the table a pump some tubes you know that those tubes are just regular hoses really anyway and then a few fittings um some of these net pots some clay balls and of course some plants as well and yep yeah. And we are also, this is our new project in, in Moss Side in Manchester. And if you're in Manchester, please come and visit us. Um, it's our new home. And uh, we moved into the building in 2019 through a community asset transfer. Uh, we've got the building for the next 12 years. We're slowly developing. It doesn't quite look like that at the moment, but um, 
it's we're getting there so the green roof on the right hand side of the building is is being built in the next um, month or so um, but we do uh we will be um uh, we're just well with jules actually who's about to talk we're going to be setting up a hydroponic system um this week um there and starting to test that out um and we'll definitely stay in touch with your network to to sort of compare how um how that works for us it's actually the vidra farm system as well mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting to you know to to compare and contrast um we're also looking at a green wall um at the front of the building which is just near the main entrance and and it, the boiler house is very much about empowering people to um you know be sustainable and so we won't be just getting a, a sort of external contractor in to to, to 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 sort of develop hydroponics aquaponics maybe as well systems at the boiler house is somewhere where people can really have a go at doing it themselves because we think that that's the best way to 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 learn but also um you know benefit the local community from from people coming together and and um you know you know um you know making friends etc so um that's what's happening at the boiler house um right that that that's over to over to jules now so sorry that was a, a quite a long winded uh, um yeah explanation but um it's quite a complex topic and um, yeah, yeah. Really is. Oh, thanks a lot for that john and it's it's really interesting that so many of the things you've come across have been replicated in my experience even though we've not worked on the same projects so there's been an element of this this here is a the vitro farm itself look at uh, not exactly not growing on there but uh this this project came about more from the the social uh, aspect that John was talking about. I actually, got funding from the the NHS uh, to overcome social isolation, to work with ex prisoners, to set them up as urban farmers in the city centre. And the idea, the overall idea, was to take some of that illegally acquired horticultural knowledge and repurpose it into growing healthy, nutritious salads. So. That was the angle we were coming at. So you've got the Vibra farm here, and this has been shown at the at Tatton, RHS Tatton. And I think backing up again what John says there, it, it always is a conversation starter. Uh, people have generally intrigued at hydroponics uh, because they don't understand how something can grow in what they call unnatural light. Uh, the, this produced a cluster of jobs uh, people in mushroom farming, aquaponics and hydroponics. But I'd just like to, you know, full disclosure, I'd just like to say it it was difficult to get people to convert to a new crop, um, which was less lucrative than their existing crop. And there are a lot of barriers to, um, in terms of retraining people. So next slide, please. Yeah, sure. So again, this this is the same unit, and this is the one that we're going to be we're, we're setting up at the boiler house as well. You'll see here Stephen Fry from Vidra Farm, which is part of the big hydro garden um, kind of hydroponic supply network in in the country. Now, it's quite there are quite a few tricks and tri tips and tricks to setting it up, and you'd probably the, the keen eyed amongst you will notice that it's a very in unsanitary environment it hadn't been fully tanked at that stage it was a a cellar underneath a cafe in Salford and there were airflow issues so I'll just quite tell you quickly about the the factors we learned using the Vidra farm and things which you do well to to consider if you're trying to reach a healthy crop um, expect losses like John said um, trial and error different varieties Yes, different Stephen Fry to Mr. QI, exactly. Um, different varieties. Always try fast growing, soft type crops, basil, parsley, salad. The beauty of these you, these tubes, and these are individually cost £200 each to buy, there, um, is that you literally put your finger inside that socket there and not get an electric shock. I think they're about seven watts. So the whole of the electrical rig of this is one plug, uh, the pumps, one plug. So you can, depending on, you can use that handy spreadsheets that uh, John gave you to, to just calculate some of the, uh, the, 
the, the running costs. But in in terms of how many plants, I think there's a 240 different plants here that you can fit in there. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not going to supply you a supermarket chain. It's you may be going to get um, something like 720 lettuces of plants per month if you propagate them. Sorry, if you um, germinate them separately mm -hmm. and then transfer them when they've already got quite a lot of growth on them and need the lights. Uh, wholesale prices, maybe a five, six pound for a, a head of 12 lettuces in a box, maybe looking at a, an income of 300 pound per month, or if it's ten, a box of 10, maybe about 288 pound a month. Or if they're ideally sold direct, about pound a head, then obviously if all your lettuces are grown, grown good quality, looking about 720 pound a month. So we weren't looking at something initially that would scale up on this project to a livable turnover. It was definitely seen as a side project for somebody who had other income and had a good an interest in hydroponics. The the what there was mole growth, but as you can see, that's bare brick behind there. You'd need to make it quite a, um, um, a hygienic environment. Water temperature was key. So I know we've got uh, Phil Mansfield there who also has an aquaponics unit. And I don't know if he'd concur, but we, we felt that rather than heating the air, we dropped a, um, a, a fish tank heating element. I think it just cost about eight pounds into the water and kept the heat, the water at, at a constant temperature. So the roots weren't shocked. And we found that by maintaining the, the temperature of the water, we were able to kind of ensure a more even grow. You can also cut down on energy use as well by maybe putting on a timer and just doing it sort of, um, uh, maybe you can do look at any different combination, but 16 hours on to put eight hours off. And also make sure there's a really good air exchange as well. You need high CO2 levels. So luckily we were in Salford. So there were over 700 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere outside the this farm. Um, so absolutely no problem getting with it, needing to enrich the air with CO2. Uh, but yeah, keep it coming through, Get keep the air to, and turn going. And you can use, use even a simple inland, inline ventilator that you might find in, in a, a kind of a DIY show or kind of. So growth supplements as well. We went for the organic, but obviously make sure your pH isn't then um, going too high because your salads will need 6.5 to 7. And also, after every grow, make sure you're dipping those uh, loads of units, those runs into some sort of sanitizer before you put in a fresh batch. And another quick thing is make sure you've got uh, ideally somebody who wants to compost all the roots and leftover um, salads. So, yeah, it was. We we also tried and this was a this is with a hydro garden. I think it's an excellent system. It's incredibly low wattage. So a lot of the problem with the, the running costs, the operating costs of any any sys, any of the hydroponic system is the, the light energy, the cost of the energy from the lighting system. It's it's often illegally sourced, it can be a real, you know, often while kind of Hydro horticultural growers might use a greenhouse and just use the actual water flow and to supply nutrients to their plants. They might not always go in for full lighting rigs or just maybe extend and start the season a little bit, but they haven't got usually the money to, uh, to buy the lights and to run them. So the beauty of this hydro garden is you've got so much kind of compact growing space there at just the cost of one light bulb. Um, the other project is, was moving on from this. It was almost a similar system, but built into a shipping container. A very popular idea, the shipping containers. Again, this is pre-COVID. So in Manchester, we were looking at very expensive uh, rental for land of any sort, any yard space, any parking space. And having it in a shipping container or even a repurposed caravan meant for planning applications and purposes, we didn't need to have the same level of regulations. Now, if you're in parts of Wales, Anglesey, maybe that's not the issue. So, you know, 
that that would be a great consideration that you don't have to basically put the farm on wheels. Um, the beauty of the shipping container as well was that we were able to get about 40 to 60 cubic meters of growing space by putting up uh, racking. The downside, it's a tin box. It's effectively an oven and a fridge, depending on the time of year. So massive insulation. And yeah, leave it, get it, get, turn up half an hour late and everything was fried. So it, having that, I know you've got people like uh, Jody who's studying uh, controlled environment agriculture. Yeah, the full Vidra farm system often sits inside a much bigger uh, controlled unit where you even have pre programmed software per, for each seed. So a completely controlled environment from seed to, to cropping. But uh, if you're looking at um, doing that yourself, you will have to be really on it in terms of make, keeping the keeping all those in balance. And I totally recommend looking at some of the offerings, uh, the internet of things, some amazing sensors and tracking devices, which are pennies after what they used to be and offer you know, such things as sort of temperature or measurement straight to your mobile phone. So you can always nip down there if things look like they're going seriously out of whack. So really good system from the V farm. Um, I suppose it's fair to just talk about the wider implications. Make sure you've got a good team around you that has a complete range of skills and I know that a couple of you are interested. Yeah, the Vidra Farm is expensive to set up. The unit itself is around 5,000. Like I said, those lights itself, each one 200 pounds. Um, but make sure you've got a range of people who are really interested in the growing side, but also some customer facing skills as well. I noticed a couple of you are looking at supply chain and short, short supply chain. And again, this has got a real viability as to, as a way of supplying microherbs or fresh herbs for a, a small restaurant, especially if you're in a more remote, remote, remote part of the countryside where uh, getting a, a box of microherb actually at around 12 to 15 pound a box with a delivery charge just doesn't make it viable. So having something like this, as well as a talking point and a way of driving traffic into your restaurant, cafe, farm shop, it, it's also a, a really cost-effective way of growing those things and getting premium quality as well. Um, I think that's about it. Um, like I said, think about the team. Think about having a, a maybe a few more people than you think you need at the start because it can be a little bit of a round-the-clock thing. Make sure that you're in close proximity to the unit. Try not to site your farm too far from where you live or work. And... Uh, definitely look into the more esoteric types of of um, gourmet crops if you want to get a good profit on it because obviously the kilo weight of those things are often in their hundreds as opposed to things like normal salad crops. So yeah, I hope that's been useful and really looking forward to answering any questions. Thanks, Jules. Yeah, that was great. Um... So I've just got a couple of slides just to summarise, really, and then we'll then we'll we'll do the questions. So yeah, advantages. It's good for situations where there's you know limited access to soil um, or water, um, like space, or um, on a rooftop or in a basement um, where you wouldn't be able to grow otherwise. It's uh, what we found is it's really good, and Jules as well. It's really good for engagement. It can be, it, there's no weeding. Um, there is probably less pests and disease, particularly if you have it um, in a really controlled condition. Um, Jules was showing that basement there. And particularly if you, you know, you, you kind of seal seal the space, um, then you can, you can potentially do it without um, having to deal with that problem. Uh, it can be automated fairly easily through things like sensors. Uh, and it, it, it can be actually very high tech. So yeah, you could you could sort of have um, you could have um, sensors that connected to Wi-Fi, for example. You can get really good yields, and there's a bit of a caveat with that, and that is that 
that's assuming that you get all of these sort of variables tuned and 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 um, everything's kind of working properly. Um, so there's a bit of fiddling around before you get that, and you can get uh, just think, yeah, you could potentially you can get a good return on investment, and um, I think you're more likely to get that if you don't use lighting actually i have a feeling that those systems where you're using uh greenhouse and of course there's a there's a sort of upfront capital cost of a greenhouse but you can then um do the hydroponics without led lighting which is is cheaper but is still very expensive and um and also grow the sorts of crops that um jules were talking about premium kind of you know more esoteric um uh, veg and uh, maybe microgreens as well um but, you know they they're, they're much higher value and some of the issues are that you need a quite a lot of technical knowledge i think i kind of enjoy that actually um but um it probably isn't for somebody that doesn't want to try and try and think about you know plant nutrients and things like that um it is costly in terms of upfront cap capital costs uh if you do get problems with pests and disease then that 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 can spread right through the system and equally if there's technical failure with the system then then again you know the a sort of um a common concern with hydroponics is that the the pump breaks um you know in the middle of the night and you're not there normally your plants will probably be okay if they don't get um that nutrient for a few hours but if you didn't notice for a few days then then that would probably probably be a problem and yeah i think there's a sort of um there's a kind of almost cultural aspect to it with um people i think on the right hand side the photos are sort of you know an organic farm i think there's a sort of technology versus organic kind of um you know thing going on there where i think sometimes people find that sort of technology quite threatening and 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 um you know perhaps not part of a, a sort of ecological solution for um you know some of the problems that we've got um environmentally and the final thing here is that yeah you can't grow everything in a hydroponic system uh it's ideally suited for sort of leafy leafy plants really so that is that's it from me um and so i think luke has maybe had a look to see what uh, questions people might have asked is that right luke um uh, just I'll just turn my audio on yeah yes i've uh, i've been keeping in, keeping track of them uh there's, there's very good uh some very good questions from the participants so uh i'll go ahead and uh, put some of those to you but uh, first of all i'd like to uh, thank you both for uh, putting together the presentation i thought that was really helpful and uh, you've uh, given a very good overview and uh, your both perspectives have been very um very well thought out so um the first first question we had was from um uh, was from debbie handley from uh, uh mentor business um uh or F farming connect i believe you uh, uh you, you work with um so you you asked um what what this uh, this idea of future of sustainable food uh, actually meant with the context of hydroponics and um i was um I was wondering if you uh, if, if either either john or jules wants to elaborate a little bit on uh how it was uh, the future of sustainable food or uh, a component of a sustainable food producing uh model for the future whether there was anything new you had to add to that yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether it is. Um, you know, I, I guess you probably sense that I'm not. You know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm sort of sitting on the fence a bit with it um, mm -hmm. as I went through the presentation. But it has got advantages. Um, it, it, you know, as as I pointed out, um, the it, it can be used in in places that are 
not suitable for agriculture. Yeah, you know, we do have a, a you know a rapidly growing population. We're also depleting all of the soil. Um, you know, ideally we wouldn't deplete <laughs> the soil um, on the planet. Um, but if that that does happen, then um, you know it could be a, a, a way to produce food um, sustainably. Um, because um, you know, I think particularly with organic systems, it's it it it. it I mean, it it can it can uh, apparently it can use ninety percent less water than 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 you know than sort of traditional agriculture. So that that that's good, kind of environmentally. Um, but also, it can mean that crops can be grown. Uh, year round, um, and that that can reduce food miles as well. Mm. Um, I, so yeah. there's a few sort of things there, but yeah. And Go I, on, I, Jordan. I think there's so many different mindsets in agriculture, and so many different ways of. Well, so my perfect solution would be a blend, or to be at least an openness be, to adopt the best of other people's practices, but. Like I said, with the organic movement not adopting any sort of standards for hydroponics and aquaponics, then there is a very soil versus technology uh, discussion, which, you know, it's, it's a shame in a way because uh, it, I think more uh, a more research led approach would be would be appreciated. OK. OK. Um... Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for those, those responses. Um, uh, we had a question from uh, Kate Leonard. She was one of our one of our growers as part of the Tech Devi project. Uh, Kate, um, Kate uh, runs a uh, business a food distribution business called Real Roots in McIntyre, uh, and supplying various local uh, restaurants and shops, and has been, uh, been part of the Pathways to Farming project. At, uh, so she's asked, John, please could you um, uh, elaborate a little bit on your experience of using organic fertilisers? Um, she uses the three feeds that she mentioned on her outdoor veg. But she isn't sure about the concentrations to begin experimenting with in her NFT system. So just to say, she's using uh, exactly the same um, sort of Hydro Garden NFT system as you've been discussing in this uh, during this um, webinar uh, for, for the pair of you. So... Um, I think she's she's ideally placed to learn quite a lot from uh, your approaches. Yeah, um, I, I I only did a, I did a couple of of sort of cycles using using organic um, fertilizer. Uh, so I, I did grow crops. I didn't think they grew quite as well as when I was using chemical fertilizer. But I was I just I'm just really determined to kind of to make make it work really, and. I, um, I, I, you know, I, I didn't really measure like how much I was putting in. I, I think it was, it, you know, it, I, I seem to remember I was using the, the, you know, when when it when you there's obviously on the back of the packet for 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 this sort of um, fertilizer, there's a set of dilution to, to you know for a for a watering can. So I think that's probably a good starting place um, for for deciding how much to use. Um, I, I have heard that. It, so, the problem with some of these organic making your own fertilizer is that some of the trace elements aren't necessarily going to be there. Uh, I think this is what the problem is. It's you know, obviously, with the plants, you can't talk to the plants and ask them what the problem is when they're not growing. So it's a little bit hard to to know. Um, but I think that was probably one of the problems. And I know that some chemical fertilizer have got these things called collates in, which are, which are chemicals, which mean that the plants, um, uh, uh, they fix to the, to the, to the, to the elements like, um, like, um, manganese or, or iron, and they make them available. This chemical makes them available for the roots. Um, and I think there might be, Part of the solution might be to add um, these collates into the mix as well um, to make the, the the yeah the these sort of these these elements available to the roots. But I mean, it did it did work. So you know, it worked. It just didn't work as well. Yeah. Um, sorry, Jules. You've you've also 
um, done a bit of organic growing, haven't you? You said that you used organic fertilizers. Is that just from shop the shops? Yeah, I've just been using a, a seaweed based one, which maybe could be useful for the Bangor and Anglesey based people if they. But yeah, the the it is a, just a question of um, trial and error. But it also might be useful to do a small sample um, grow with maybe just in a, without putting it through the entire system, so you could have two or three, four different types of um, fertilizers side by side, just to just see for yourself which grows best or which, which works best before pouring it into the system. Yeah, I, I wonder actually with the, if people have got the, that, that Vidra farm, um, you know, you probably could just sort of rig it up. So you've got one, you know, you could have, just get another pump, can't you? And sort of rig it up so that you've mm -hmm. got a different, um, it's not very difficult to do. I'm just looking at it actually because you've used it, Jules. So I haven't, I haven't set set one up, but yeah, it'd be quite easy, I think, to to sort of do to do some trials on different levels with it. Yeah, or even separate trials just on a, a plant pot, almost just before you transfer uh, okay. them in. But yeah, yeah def definitely, you can. It's very easy to you, essentially you can just replace the water in the tank, can't you, with with the different fertilizer, and and the effects will be fairly quickly seen. I think. Yeah, totally. That's what I found is that just a uh, just a few uh, days, um, you know, or, well, not not hours, but certainly within a day, you can see whether things are, are you know are working or not. Oh, very, very good. Thank you very much. Um, okay, okay. To move on to the next question, um, I've just uh, responded to a few people in the the uh, chat box. Um, so Rod, Rod Howells from Big Innovation asked if, uh, either of you have got any, uh, uh, anything to, uh, have been doing anything with different light wavelengths or, or LED lights in general. Uh, just while you're thinking about that, I'll, um, <laughs> I'll sort of throw my little or in from my sort of two, two cents into the mix. Uh, with regards to different light wavelengths, there has been some, uh, some research, uh, that we've, uh, the, some people associated with the CEH uh, group in ABBA, uh, I think mm -hmm. of, um, I can't remember off the top of my head, I think it might be um, might be Matthew Jones has done some stuff with that. Uh, I think the idea is that using sort of bluer or shorter uh, frequencies uh, could uh, are linked with the sort of slightly uh, possible reductions in growing cycle. And I think some, some people have managed to grow lettuce uh, under uh, blue LED wavelengths and they managed to make it taste a little bit more like rocket. So there do exist some potential uh, in that uh, sort of scope to modify LED light to uh, to uh, alter taste. Um, as to whether you can do this on um, some of the systems we've been talking about, um, I was quite optimistic when we ordered our, um, our hydro farms, uh, our V farms, that uh, there might have been some scope to do this, but I've um, not managed to find any. Mm. So it uh, remains an interesting uh, and uh, one of the most obvious areas for innovation. Um, so uh, certainly something I'm mm. very, very, uh, very keenly uh, aware of for, for developments. It is a fixed uh, spectrum, but however, you could you could rig um, blue light between the the pink light, the red spectrum, and just see how that works. At the same time, Jules. Or... Yeah, at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Or, or even do it in just on one level and then measure the growth between the two levels. Yeah, you could run your own experiments with it. Yeah, <laughs> um, I haven't I haven't grown with lights um, particularly, um, so I yeah I couldn't I couldn't really comment. But I mean I I do know that you know there's there's, there's different times of the year the lights different and things. So I, I just wonder mm. whether there's something about um, different colours through the through the go cycle and and. and as well yeah but, i mean specifically yeah. the vidra farm was uh, specified by a prison governor because you cannot have a blooming plant uh, a fruiting flat plant with this spectrum of light so you can only grow <laughs> green leafy vegetables and salads uh, using the v farm and possibly um, strawberries so yeah that's something right. to bear in mind yeah yeah Very good. Well, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we've 
what else have we got? Um, Ahmad Hassan asked if you used the cocoa piece in your white pipes, um, but uh, I think that was before you started talk, talking about the clay balls. Uh, so, um, yeah, I wish I'd, I, you know, I had a photo of the inside of it. So the inside is just there's nothing in the inside of the pipe um, except this 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 flow, this nutrient, you know, this this stream of nutrients that's going through the pipe. Mm -hmm. um, but the net pot has got these clay balls in it which is like a sort of soil substrate, um, you know, uh, and the, the roots are, are growing. Um, as Jules said, it's actually one of the annoying things about hydroponics is you have to grow a little seedling first and then insert it into the system. So it's not like, um, you know, you don't, have, you know, it just makes it a little bit more complicated. And then those um, seedlings grow, the roots grow through the, the clay balls and then down into the into the um, nutrient. I think I showed you a photo of kind of the, mm. the roots dangling down into the nutrient solution. Yeah, this bee farm system, we were recommended by Stephen Fry to use the um, rooted balls, you know, the the yeah. glue the glue balls, but we did also use the, the pellets the, to, to weigh those down and to make sure that they touch the water because the um, the bottom of the the, the, the rooted ball must touch the, the water. Yeah. Yeah, they just don't grow. The roots won't grow unless the the, the you know they're sort of dangling mm. to start with into the water a little bit, and then once they've found it, then they sort of search for it, don't they? Very good. Um, Alex Alex Cook asked uh, whether there was public access to the report or study findings, presumably in regards to the costing um, model that you did. Um, this is uh, something that I think we'll we'll. Uh, if if people, we've got a list of the email addresses of those who've um, who've uh, signed up to the the webinar. Yeah, and we do. Yeah, are we okay uh, distributing a copy of this to, to people? Yeah, I think I've sent it to you before, Luke. You have, yes. Send it, yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, it's it's freely available. Uh, and did you did it, uh, the, the the research was you know the lead was Salford University. Did um, I send you that, or is that? Um, I'm not sure if you did actually. I've definitely yeah. got a model. I'm not sure whether the, uh, yeah. the findings have managed to make their way to me yet. Yeah. So the model is definitely available. Um, the research, I, I'm not. You know, it's not my research. Um, we just helped with it, so um, I'll try to get hold of that, but um, uh, or, or certainly ask permission for that. But yeah, the the model you can certainly have access to. Yeah. Oh, very good. Well, thank you very much. Um, Phil mentioned, asked a question about insurance. Um, be interesting to hear both of you uh, talk about what what sort of insurance you had to consider when you were setting up your projects. <laughs> um, well, oh. Presumably, you've got. I, I would not like that conversation with my insurer. <laughs> I, I, I don't. Yeah, I, I, I don't think. We, I mean, we. I mean, we did our, our one of our projects for you know for 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 this science festival and and then you know it's on the print works roof now and i don't know whether they're speaking to their insurance company i think it's i think it's pretty much i'm not sure whether the scale that we're talking about i i don't know if it's i don't know if it's worth having that conversation really i mean mm. there's a very small there's a I mean, as, as long as the equipment, if it, say that, say with this V farm thing, you know, as long as it's been pat tested, say, mm. you know, it, it does, does it, do you really need to go into the ins and outs? It's just another electrical appliance at the end of the day. It's not particularly, mm. uh, it, it, there's a, there's a very small risk of flooding. Um, and the, the, the tank has, um, you know, has, has got a capacity, say of, of 40, 50 liters or something. So we're only talking about, um, you know, a quarter of a bath's worth of water, which might go on the floor. So I, I, I would say that it's it's pretty negligible to, to you know, on the, to to be to, to to sort of speak to your insurance company with, uh, um, with this. Well, system, perhaps yeah. perhaps it's uh it's different if you were going to have uh, sort of a public space that people were able to come in and see it, and uh, that wasn't normally open to the public. I suppose there there might be a public liability concern, but that's probably a separate issue, isn't it? I think for this um, RHS Tatton, we were asked to fill out a full risk assessment, so I think that's as far as the legals went. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, obviously, with the equipment itself being so expensive, you'd you'd really want to insure it for loss. 
Yeah, that's true. Yeah, or theft. Yeah, yeah. We well, asked our project participants to uh, ensure that appropriate insurance was in place when they uh, mm. uh, took took, a, uh, took use of the systems. Um, I suppose it depends a lot on the case and what you're using it for, how things are uh, how things are going to be uh, uh, things are going to be used. Really. Yeah. Okay. Um, just moving on through the questions a little bit. Um, Debbie Debbie from uh, Pharma Connect asked again about. Um, the cost model. I'll send that I'll send that over. Um, Ahmad Hassan asked again about if there was any licensing or permission requirements in hydroponics. And again, I suppose this is this opens up a whole a little bit of a can of worms, possibly depending on what you want to grow. And from my experience, I found that some of the higher value crops uh, there may you may start to get into that territory. So one area that obviously if you want to grow to my mind the highest value crop you can grow uh will be uh, for producing sort of cbd oils and things like that they go for enormous amounts uh, and in order to do that you need uh, you need licenses uh but on the on the smaller scale uh just to a growing sort of veg and speciality leaves and things i'm i'm unaware that uh, of any of any such uh license requirements uh i was just wondering if uh do either of you have anything no, to add to that? no i've I mean, something that just came to mind, it's a little bit of a tangent, but there's some, you know, business rates. Um, there is there is kind of agricultural exem exemptions with business rates mm -hmm. in some cases. So um, you might find that you kind of get sort of preferential business rates um, if you're producing food. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, planning applications, I, yeah, I mean, God, it's a funny area, isn't it? All of that. I mean, you know, even like the use, the use, the the use class of the building, you know, and all of that sort of stuff. So, you know, with building control and things and planning, um, I don't know, I don't, because it's it's a very it's a strange use of a building, is what I'm saying, um, and so it won't neatly fit into into categories for for you know for 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 use for for buildings, for example. Um, I don't think so. If you were doing a big project, it probably need to speak to your speak to your planning departments, really. Well, we're on that question on that subject. Um, John John Story from our Tech to Be Challenge has just asked if you could come under Market Garden for tax purposes. I don't I don't know what that means actually. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, it, it, suppose it, it may depend. <laughs> Sorry, I do that, Karen. It'd be useful to attempt that. Um, oh, I see. It's it fast as a market garden for tax purposes. Yeah, I mean, like like I say, with business business rates as well. I mean, potentially, this it could be quite good, really, in terms of tax and stuff. Yeah, maybe it depends a bit on the local authority. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. In terms of variance and how flexible had to be on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kate's just said that all food producers need to be uh, registered with the local council. This is quite. This is quite. Uh, Correct. And they might have an issue with standing water, so um, some sort of water testing. Yes, um, this, um, uh, this also is, raises the issue of environmental health. Uh, we've we've uh, uh, found that different environmental health officers have got different sort of. Uh, if you're going to sell any of this stuff, you do need to uh, you do need to keep a uh, very close eye on on what you're allowed to do and how you're how you're, you're encasing your produce. And it's very important to have a conversation with environmental health about this uh, and what we found is that different environmental health officers were uh, can be quite different in their responses some of them might have never never seen anything like a vertical farm before and perhaps be a little bit uh, uh, maybe a little bit suspicious or uh, over over uh, uh, overly harsh and others might be uh, have, have quite be quite comfortable with what you're doing but at the very least things need to be uh, kept road proof and uh, sort of uh, well ventilated and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, just moving on through the questions, we have uh, another question from Rod asking it, how many hours would you say it takes to look after a hydroponic system every week? That's a very good question. <laughs> interested uh, to hear what you've got to say about that. Yeah, there's, that's for me, there's, there's this sort of setting up and fiddling around with it. And then once you've got the hang of it, it could be really, really low. Actually, that's one of the big benefits of it. It could be, 
um you know you might want to change the, the the water every couple of weeks or so and um there's checking on the plants uh, i mean I, I feel like a couple of hours a week maybe i don't know what you think jules yeah i'd go along with that it's it's two hours sensors yeah. in place and then you can know if you need to be there but if once it's ticking over it does look after itself up to a point yeah i've uh I found a similar sort of similar sort of uh, time commitments myself. Um, I think it, it does involve you know checking on things, to make sure that your uh, your meter readings aren't going aren't going uh, going into danger zones. But uh, it's not particularly time consuming stuff. It's only a quick dip in of your pH and EC meters. Um, so we have a question from Sarah. Um, which is uh, concerned with supply chains. So she asks to find customers who want more high value microherb type crops. Do you need to be in a built up city rather than the countryside to make it economical? I'll let Jules answer this one as the food <laughs> enterprise expert. <laughs> no, it's about having a relationship with a good local um, buyer. So it could be that you've got a spa, a luxury hotel, or even people who are interested in health a whole food store, anyone who, and then growing specifically for their needs. And uh, you've got a real advantage in if you're very local to them. Um, and also, if you think about the, the size of your system and the needs of your clients, you might get a chef that will just crop a handful of micro herb. And that's basically almost like two punnets. So a single dish that's selling 40 or 50 a night, then might take a whole box or two of micro herb or, or basil or parsley garnish from you. So one good restaurant or, or hotel that's got a nice bit of trade, you know, pre-COVID, then it, it will basically take most of, the thing, most of everything you grow. This is um, one of the things we're hoping to investigate a bit with our tech delivery challenge um, uh, project sorry mm. uh, we're look, we're obviously based in um, a fairly rural low population density area and uh, we're inter interested in seeing what supply chain possibilities there are um, we, we, we already have some some growers associated with us who've got some good uh, who are sort of uh, showing that this can be done um, Kate, Kate is one of them we've mm. uh, it's, the most remote parts of Wales and um, Macintyre. It's very, uh, but there are some 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 Michelin star restaurants. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some very uh, some very high end uh, uh, eating establishments, uh, as well as the tourism industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are uh, these uh, this, as you as you say quite correctly, uh, Jules. There's a good relationships to be had with the uh, uh, with these buyers. That is going to be more important than geographical uh, location. And with the visual web, it, it in it's so important to have well garnished attractive looking food so it's almost anything you see has always got micro herbs herbs uh, you know micro vegetables decorating it so and, and then also i'm not so sure about south wales but it might be the same as north wales is that that it's supplied from the manchester wholesale market so the markup on the deliveries is often phenomenal you know double sometimes triple the the um, the wholesale cost it, it, just for delivery charges. So it can be really beneficial for a, a small restaurant or, or hotel to have a local grower. And also they will not get the awards without that relationship. It's almost like an essential part of the package now to be working closely with, uh, with your supply chain. Um. Oh, very good, thank you very much. I think that's uh, some useful insights. Um, we have a question from Jane asking as to what gourmet crops mean. Uh, I think we covered a little bit of this since the question was asked. Um, but um, uh, I was wondering if people had, uh, if there were any other sort of high value crops that perhaps either of you have identified or been able to comment on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I mean, where I've I've only grown sort of fairly standard. I, I was, I you know, I, I suppose, you know, my my 
Uh, we, we've not particularly been thinking about selling selling veg. We've we've used the system for for testing out, see if it works. Really, I suppose, rather than than kind of thinking about selling it. Um, so yeah, I, I I I wouldn't I wouldn't know. Mm, mm. Very good. I, yeah. It's, it, I think it's. This is one of the questions that yeah. remains to be developed. You know, there's there, there are answers out there. I think but they, they yeah. kind of require to try them. But uh... yeah, you can also get really. I mean, a really good seed catalog, and they'll provide a lot of the kind of ready-made mixes, which uh, provide really, really good commercial kind of mixed salad bags and uh, micro herbs. So yeah, check out a good a good supplier, organic or, or conventional. Yeah, I, Jules, did you grow micro herbs using the Vidra farm, or was that is, is that because uh, would you not use no. a, like that sort of tray system for that? <laughs> no, you're totally right. I wasn't going to mention this, but it, it's um, <laughs> sorry. Growing micro herbs, it, it actually completely you don't need that flow of water. In fact, that's you'd kind of almost wash away the little seedling yeah, yeah. So that were those were grown in flat trays, which. We, we experimented with all different types of substrates growing yeah. yeah. actually the the best one was one I've sub subsequently seen in the shops which is a sort of mashed potato believe it or not so um um which is basically you, it's just like growing cress on block blotting paper and yeah. You yeah. Back as well as you can use a flat saw to just you know cut the heads off in one fell swoop if you like and harvest it really yeah. quickly yeah but yeah, you can I've... use the hydro garden system, the the Vidra farm, to just lay the trays on top of the the um the if, okay. if you want to use that wonderful, expensive and low cost light. Nice, yeah. And then all oh, right, great. Yeah, I haven't had a go with uh, microhoves, but yeah, that's how I thought it was done. And there's there's like a, a mat that you can buy as well, isn't there? Because there's a question mm -hmm. about whether you can it's it's also an NFT system, isn't it? Um but it, you, you know, there's a mat that you can buy. You, you sprinkle your seeds in to basically really high um, micro microgreens. You just you're just germinating some seeds near enough, yeah. aren't you? And then growing them for about ten days afterwards. So the turnaround <laughs> is very, very, very quick, um, yeah. which means you yeah. can churn out quite a lot. Um, you know, you have a lot of cycles, don't you, per year? Yeah, and being, being close to your market in that way, it, it's perfect because you're extending the shelf life and these aren't these are really expensive you'll be paying between two and four pounds upon it for a chef yeah. and you know you don't want that to be wilting away in your in your fridge yeah yeah it's uh one um one thing that we've we've also uh, uh not 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 quite touched on, but it's it's a it's an, an area that's to be uh, to be explored is uh, how much value can be added to food by being creative about how you market it. Mm. So one thing that we did on our flood and drain system as recently is um, uh, we just put down one of these mats that you just mentioned and we started growing some wheatgrass. And wheatgrass, you know, it's quite, you know, you, you wouldn't put it on your fish and chips really. I mean, you can, <laughs> but it's not very nice. It, uh, you have to get it quite soon or it becomes quite stringy or, and unsavoury. But uh, you can do things like make a pesto out of it. So, you know, the yeah, possibilities I mean, exist for, you know, growing something that's economically not too difficult, but uh, putting all of the effort into the branding. And if you're looking at sort of highly bespoke grass, uh, there were solutions where you were almost using commercial type of upright fridges to grow uh, horse, horse fodder for horse food. Um, and obviously that meant that you could uh, it was a very specialist market for but uh, extremely well high growth that's another interesting sort of sector hmm. mm. i think uh maybe i'll make this uh, this one the last question um we have one from alex alex cook about um the theory behind cleaning down uh cleaning down the system after every crop and asked whether it'd be possible to filter and return water to prevent buildup of nasties. Um, I think uh, just while you're thinking about that, um, one thing we've observed really is that sort of a cycle sort of takes up about three quarters of the of the um, of the the water that you have uh, in the tank. And um, uh, one issue that you do get is an influx of uh, bacteria and fungi and spores and so forth that um, um, can lead to algal buildup. So it is very important that you clean 
clean down, flush down your system uh, after using it and that you uh, ensure that there aren't things that build up. Um, and you do use about three quarters of it for every cycle um, in, in the plant, in the plants themselves. But uh, um, if either of you two have any, any experience or insights on that, what, what, what do you find about possible possibility of returning water after processing it? Um, is this reuse? So is this reusing the water? Um, so let's say you. So I, I mean, I, what I've done is that I've um, I've replaced the water every couple of weeks. Um, and is the question whether you can reuse that water, or is it to do with? I think I think so. Um, I think Alex is just hoping to clarify whether we've got it right. Um, um, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I've, I, yeah. I mean, I've used that. I just kind of gone and watered the plants in the garden with that water, actually. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, not in the Middle East, is it? I mean, we we do have some access to water here, but yeah, it's it's good practice, I think, but probably more more trouble than it's worth. Yeah, I mean, the deep I clean. I, I do a deep clean. Um, you know, maybe just like at the end of the cycle, rather than sort of deep cleaning every couple of weeks. Um, it's quite a quite a lot of work to to to, to sort of you know really get the detergent in there or whatever and give it a clean. And uh, as to whether you can top the water up, I think there's uh, uh, well, the issue there is that you um, uh, the longer things as soon as you get any kind of algae inside your uh, your system, it uh, because it's a continuous cycle. It, uh, it's, uh, your, your likelihood of it clogging up one of your pipes or accumulating on some of the uh, uh, some of the root material is uh, increased uh, considerably uh, the, the more you have the more you have it, you have it circulating through. Mm. Using the the kind of the plugs that the sponges to grow in, I think you you eliminate a lot of the substrate falling into the water, and also you can top up the tank and even put a little extra filter in there if you want to. It's manageable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, very good. I feel as if we, we think we've reached the end of the questions. Um, should we uh, thinking about drawing things to a close, perhaps? Yeah, that sounds good. And um, yeah, I mean, thanks, thanks for inviting um, uh, me along to talk. And um, I think we'd really love to, 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 you know, we should definitely stay in touch. We're not far away from each other, and. Um, you know, you know, sort of include us, uh, Luke, in in your your sort of testing and and contrasting and things like that, because we're just literally about to set up this Vidra farm and start using it almost exactly the same time. It's uh, quite uh, quite timely that we're both uh, doing these things at the same sort of uh, same sorts of uh, things at the same time. Um, Yes, I, I'm in, enormously grateful for you, uh, uh, for, to both of you, for um, taking the time to uh, to uh, share your insights. It's been really useful. Uh, this presentation has been recorded, I believe. Well, I can still see the uh, record button. So this is going to be made available um, uh, on at some stage in the near future. Uh, so yeah, just uh, I'd like to uh, the. Uh, uh, thank you again for uh, a, a really interesting presentation. <laughs> thank you. Thank okay. you so much for attending. It's great of you to all join us. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. And uh, yes, let's stay in touch and uh, see what uh, abilities uh, present themselves. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Very good. Goodbye.